So my name is Katie Arrington. Um, I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Acquisition and Sustainment in OSD. Um, basically, that means I am the, the belly button for all things cyber across ANS, acquisition and sustainment. Um, who, so I know Sean asked this morning, who here knows about the CMMC? Raise your hand. Who's seen me talk before? Oh, dang, I got to get new material. I feel like, like um, Dave Chappelle, like they keep going through and you, you like hone in your show. But I, I also have um, that military in my head that you have to say it three times before it actually becomes real. So the CMMC started a long, long time ago in March of last year. Um, I came to the department, those people who haven't heard the story, um, I am a recovering politician. I am, um, I came from industry. So I started at Booz Allen Hamilton, the chip's right there. Um, I then went to a service disabled veteran owned small business. Then I went to a non-traditional software company. Then I started my own. Now luckily I sold it. And I ran uh, to, in South Carolina. I was part of the executive board for the state of South Carolina, cyber. 2012, anybody remember that year? Great year in South Carolina. We had a breach, remember it? I do. Do you know why we had the breach? Trivia. We didn't encrypt it. We didn't encrypt. It wasn't rocket science, right? We didn't get hacked by like this extremist group. It actually happened because we didn't encrypt the data. Why? Because it was too much money. I'm going to use, your name is? Hi, I'm gonna use your magic stone. These right here, now if you've heard me speak before, you're gonna hear the same joke, but it's the truth. When Al Gore invented the internet, he didn't know what he did, okay? These are magic stones. They're everything. They get powered by some crazy thing. You plug it into a wall, and the next thing you know, the world is yours. Next thing you know, you are theirs. Everything has happened so fast to us that we're, we, we're playing catch up. But we're not unique, okay? There's every country in the world, every, every facet has got caught up on this. How do we know that? A, each year in the United States, we lose $600 billion, billion. The defense just rolled out their budget yesterday. We're at $736 billion a year in defense. That's the whole of defense, right? And we're losing $600 billion a year to our adversaries in XPIL, IP loss, data right loss, it's trade up cyber espionage. How much is that per US citizen? Somebody said her had $4,000 after taxes per US citizen every single year. And we're not unique. Every country on the globe is going through the same phenomenon. We are not unique. What we do need to do is figure out what we're gonna do about it. But I still had this passion about cyber. And the department brought me in and they said, um, Mr. Fahey, my boss, the Honorable Kevin Fahey, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, and his boss, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, called me and said, would you come and help? I was like, yeah, call, sign me up. I came in January 6th to be exact. My boss said, take six weeks, tell me what's wrong. On the sixth day, I had figured out how to get back to my office in the Pentagon and his office, and I said, so I'm done. And he said, what? And I said, yeah, I'm done. You said it, Miss Lord said it, then acting secretary Shanahan said it, we needed a unified cyber standard, why? Because when I was a contractor, and I was bidding on work, every sin that the government committed, I, I felt it. And I knew what I needed to do for us. I knew that we needed one unified cyber standard because you will do anything to make it right when the government clearly defines what they want you to do and we're willing to pay for it. Prior to that, when it came to cyber, um, President Obama signed an executive order in 2014. 
late 2013, early 2014, that made the NIST 171 come to life. And they said, you must take this. If you touch controlled unclassified information, not CDI, CUI, onto your network, you must attest, I certify that my company is implementing all 110 of these controls. We gave ourselves to 2017 to put it on all contracts that had CUI. Industry has been attesting they're doing it. That's the problem set, right? Everybody's been going, yep, I signed that contract, I'm attesting. And then they say, oh, I have a poem. I'm not really doing all 110 controls, wink. The adversary loves us. And then there was this other thing that popped out. It was called the DODIG. Anybody here of the Inspector General? Spent a lot of time with them. They wrote a report on contractor networks last year. Has anybody seen that? Okay. They surveyed, I think, don't get me wrong, and I'm a numbers girl, but 100 contractors and the department. They had three main findings. Finding number one, everyone's guilty of it. We were not changing our passwords across the board. Passwords were passwords. Passwords were company names. Passwords were so easy, it wasn't even funny. Number two, we were not using two-factor authentication the way we should be. We weren't implementing it. And the third thing we were doing, we were mismarking data all over the place. So I came in, very clear, easy stuff. This is not If we do basic stuff every day right, the hard stuff becomes much more easier to adapt to. So how do we get cyber into our day-to-day -day conversation? How do we make it easy so that we all understand and there's a common language life? We are not reinventing the wheel here, people. But the one thing you should take away from that is, who leads the world in technology, standards, and what is acceptable? Us. When we, the DOD, the largest buyer of power and product in the United States of America say, this is how we need something, and we're willing to pay for it, it happens. So. I needed to unify a cyber standard, and I needed to take all the different disparate languages and combine it into one easily understood, achievable standard. I needed two to realize all security does not fit, one size does not fit all in security. Three, I needed to find a way to pay for it because I couldn't ask you to do what I wasn't willing to pay for. So we created this. Last year in March, I started out with a team, um, no kidding, it was me, a guy named John Gartska, Buddy Dees, and Dr. John Choi. And I said, guys, we're gonna create this model. And they originally, um, we set right out in March, we went to contract with um, APL and Johns Hopkins, and we created this. I had to have a key mission statement, right? So the key mission statement is, Cost, schedule, and performance are only effective in a secure environment. That, therefore, security is foundational. Cost, schedule, and performance have no value if they're not in a secure environment. It doesn't matter if I negotiated a good price and you have met it in delivery if our adversary has it by the time you deliver it. It doesn't matter if you deliver on schedule what we agreed to if the adversary has it at that time. And it really doesn't matter if the performance equals the requirements. If the adversary has it by the time we deliver it, it's, it's a moot point. So we changed. The culture of the Department of Defense has changed. How do I know that? A, the model. B, the adaptive acquisition framework. We're rewriting the 5000 series. And internal to the department, I can tell you, I'm over my office, what I'm over, I'm over weapon systems, I'm over infrastructure, and I'm over the div, and making sure that cybersecurity is embedded in each of those. It has been a cultural shift in the department. This is the way they are thinking. We rewrote the DOD instruction 5000 based on this. Security is foundational. But that doesn't help in the legacy systems, right? That helps in the stuff that we're building today that we're developing today. So how do we get good on the stuff we've got? 
So we came up with this model, and those of you who have been tracking it, I've been, we've been at it for a minute now. We just released Rev.1, and I want to go through to the history. So we started with Rev.4. Does anybody remember Rev.4? It's massive. It's 340 practices, I believe, because I took all of those disparate standards and I put them into one document. And I said, is this control in the ISO and in NIST 53 and NIST 171 all the same? Okay, let's condense it. But more importantly, what is the derived outcome of that requirement?